Kia ora koutou, ko Eva toku ingoa. Uh, my name is Eva, um, and the other presenter today is Ben Logan Mill. We are here from New Zealand Parliament from the Parliamentary Engagement Team, and our team is in charge of lots of stuff actually, um, communications, digital platforms, so the website and social media, um, education programs, interparliamentary relations. We do a lot of work to engage with the public and um, that's part of why we're doing this webinar today. We're really excited that you're all here and we're very, very lucky to have as our resident expert with us today, David Wilson, the Clerk of the House, who's here to answer all of our technical questions. Thank you very much for being here, David. You're welcome and kia ora, everyone. So, um, uh, Eva's going to tell you a bit about Mao uh, about uh, the, the Q&A webinar, but uh, just a little bit of context here. Back in February, we ran a workshop for young people about submissions and select committees. And we learned two really important things from that workshop. First is there were lots of people who were really interested to participate, but couldn't be there in person. And the second is that lots of people had really interesting questions about submissions and about select committees in general. Cool. So this Q&A interactive webinar is intended to collect all of your questions about select committees and how to make a submission. Our hope is that your feedback will help us create a more permanent resource on our website that um, is co-designed by the group here today. We want to make it easier for the uh, public to participate and ask in Parliament, and we think public submissions is a really great way of doing this. Um, the great thing about public submissions is that anyone of any age can make a submission. You don't have to be in New Zealand, you don't have to be a New Zealand citizen, um, you don't have to be of voting age, anyone can make a sub submission. So we'll try to answer as many of your questions as Ben said in this um, webinar. Um, but if we can't, we'll note it down and get back to you. Cool. So some house rules before we get started. The way we've structured our session today is we'll start with some background on what select committees do and how submission making works. We'll explain how you can make a submission and give you some tips and advice. And during this, we'll pause periodically uh, where it's natural to do so to ask uh, David your questions. So you can type your questions anytime into the chat bar. And uh, please, if we use some technical knowledge or there's something you want us to go into further detail about, please put that in the chat bar as well. Before we begin, we'd like to hear from you about why you're here today. What brought you to this webinar? So Eva's going to throw up a, a quick poll. And uh, if you could just answer that, it'll help get a sense of uh, what brought you to this webinar uh, today. You can uh, chuck thoughts into the chat bar as well. So we're asking, have any of you made a submission uh, before or visited a select committee? And we can see with the answers coming in that quite a few of you have made a submission before, but a majority haven't visited or made a submission before. And we sometimes call select committees the engine room of parliament. So uh, when we've got some more results for that poll, yeah, I think we've got quite a lot. Yeah. Would anyone be happy to share perhaps um, if they have visited a select committee before or made a submission a little bit about their experience in the chat? Um, feel free to chuck your comments in there. While you're writing your comments, um, the reason that this is sort of, the reason we're coming, uh, coming to you with this today is that it has a lot of value. Uh, when parliament meets, they make decisions that affect you and that affect all of New Zealand. And if you have an in-depth with a conversation with a group of people that can be difficult, parliament is 120 people. It's really difficult to have an in-depth discussion on an issue. And this is where committees come in. Select committees are small groups of members of parliament from different parties who work together to look at issues in detail. There are a number of committees, each focusing on different areas that affect you, things like health or education or Nātake Māori. 
petitions, proposed laws, and changes to existing laws are just a few of the things that committees looked at. So we've had some comments in the chat bar. You want to read some of them, Eva? Yeah, sure. Um, so Denise said that she found, oh, they found it a very democratic process where our opinions were valued and listened to. So that's really great feedback, and I'm glad um, that that was the experience that you had. We have someone here called Catherine who says they have no experience with submitting to committees that are learning about legal resources. And so they're interested in talking about it from that reason. Uh, we also have someone called Hans who said they have visited a select committee hearing at Parliament House before. That's encouraging. Keep doing that. And Emily um, mentioned the trust bill, um, which said it was quite a technical discussion, but interesting to see the discussion firsthand. Um, yeah, and there is quite a few pieces of legislation um, that go through Parliament that can be quite technical. So it's great to see um, people getting more involved to try and find out more about what it's about. I'll end that poll now. Thanks for taking part in that. And I'll share the results. Mm. Cool. So we can see that 59% of attendees today um, haven't done any of those options, which is quite interesting. Brilliant. So many large organisations will split their work between smaller groups. Um, that just means more thorough and detailed work can be done. And our parliament, the House of Representatives, has 120 people in it. So it really does make sense to break off into smaller groups. Another great way um, or thing about breaking off into smaller groups is that members of parliament with particular knowledge sets or expertise can sit on those committees and lend their um, you know, prior knowledge and expertise to those discussions. Select committees are also usually collegial and work together to produce the best um, material possible. And they always report back to the 120 members. So there is accountability there. There are 12 select committees and they have a loose correlation with ministries and government departments. For example, the health committee and the ministry of health. There are five specialist committees responsible for some of the niche functions in parliament. Functions like reviewing parliament's standing orders, the rules of parliament, uh, determining the business, so what gets debated and other regulations. There are also ad hoc committees, which can be created for a short term for a one specific purpose. A good example of that is the newly established Epidemic Response Committee. But let's look at the subject committees. The committees mainly examine proposed laws that have been referred to them by the House, by Parliament. They consider petitions sent in by the public. They inquire into matters of public importance a good example of that is the response to the Christchurch earthquakes. They review and make recommendations on government spending, ensuring that the government of the day doesn't exceed its authority or its budget. And they respond to other general items of business that are sent in by the public, like letters from the public or from other committees. Committees usually consider uh, many items of business at the same time and report back to the house and make recommendations on the things that they've considered. Might be interesting for, after, for us to have a quick look at the process of how law is made, which is on screen. And Lee, Eva will also uh, post a link to that in the chat bar. So as you can see, um, after the first reading of a bill, when it's introduced, the bill will be referred or sent to a select committee for consideration. And what committee it will go to depends on the subject matter of that bill. Um, after the select committee process, it goes on to the second reading. Um, so this, of course, only um, applies to items of business that are about a bill. Um, but yeah, there, the link is in the chat if you want to know a little bit more about that process. Shall we move to some questions now, Beth? We have some really interesting questions people have been asking. Uh, we have one here that says, Sometimes submission deadlines are tight and submissions often require a lot of consultation. Can someone ask for an extension and what would the process be? David, could you help us with that? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so yes, the, the standard deadline for submissions is six weeks, but often it's based on a select committee getting six months to look at a bill. Where it gets less time, um, it has to give a shorter deadline for submissions as well. So if people can't get them in on time, um, contact the committee staff and ask about getting, getting an extension. Um, committees are generally pretty happy to give them. So um, I really, you know, it is, it is worth asking and, and you'll probably get one. If they're, in a, if they're in a really tight time frame, they might not be able to, but otherwise they're pretty happy. There's another really interesting question here. Are the select committees newly established by each new government depending on their priorities? Okay, well, they're not established by the government at all. They're established by parliament. Um, and Parliament as a whole has agreed that the 12 committees that Ben had up on the screen before will always exist through the life of every Parliament. Um, so no, they're not. Um, they're, they're set up and they exist on an ongoing basis to, to scrutinise the government. Sometimes though, um, particular committees are set up if Parliament wants to focus on something in particular, like epidemic response at the moment, like abortion law previously, but they're, they're creatures of Parliament, not of the government. <laughs> We've also got a question here. Um, what is the government doing to ensure that select committees are upholding their duties to hear from all ethnic groups here in Aotearoa? Well, I guess I'd go back to the point that the, the government doesn't do anything about that because select committees don't work for the government. They're completely separate from it. Although obviously some of the MPs on them are members of government parties. Um, so that really is something for Parliament to do, not for the government. Um, and I, I think if people feel that's not happening, um, they're really best to approach the chair of the committee or a member of the committee that they might know of and, and ask them um, about that. We have one more question here, which is how long should select committees have to get a petition decision made? Yeah, this is something that comes up from time to time because of course they have no deadline for petitions, unlike for bills. Um, and, and committees are strongly encouraged by the whole of Parliament to consider petitions pretty quickly. Um, they do have to compete with their other work, of course, as well, and sometimes the answers aren't that simple. So it would be good if they could turn them around in a couple of months, and sometimes it's possible. It just really depends on whether it's a complex subject or not, and what sort of information they need, and what other work they've got. Great. Cool. Well, let's keep on moving and we will come back to um, questions that are still coming in, so don't worry. Um, let's talk about submissions now. We're, so that they can make informed decisions, um, committees will often ask for your thoughts by opening public submissions. And broadly, a submission is a statement which explains your opinion because committees want to hear about how um, an item of business might affect you or other groups in New Zealand. Um, you can make a submission electronically on our website or the old-fashioned way through the post and we'll talk a little bit more about how that works later on. You might also speak to the committee in person, which we'll also talk about, and your submission will help inform what they report back to Parliament. We have a helpful resource that shows you step-by-step -step the process um, of the public submissions process. Um, which might be useful to look at as we go along. I'm going to pop the link in the chat um, so you can have a look at it, um, but we will be explaining step by step. So why does all this stuff matter? Well, democracy functions the best when a diverse range of voices are heard and when law is really carefully considered. Being civically engaged means you can make a difference. You can have your voice heard on matters that are important to you. And select committees give you a direct access to lawmakers during that decision-making stage. There are lots of really good examples of how people have influenced law or created change. So Leah Bell and Waimarama Anderson petitioned the government to create a day of commemoration for the New Zealand Lambworth and champion New Zealand history education. Um, October 23rd is now that day, and it was great last year, a plaque was put up um, in the debating chamber to recognize the New Zealand Lambworth. This is Nicole Thornton. She petitioned the house to pass laws making employee toilets accessible to people with medical conditions that require them to have immediate access to a toilet. She went and spoke directly to the health committee and the Ministry of Health is considering measures to expand access to toilets. 
when she gave her submission to the committee, she was 14 years old. And lots of groups started petitions on the issue of plastic bags. Um, a group of students from Dunedin traveled to Wellington to present their petition on banning single-use plastic bags. Um, some Marsden College students presented a petition on a 10 cent levy on plastic bags to Bryant Robertson. And preschoolers made artwork um, to contribute to the plastic bag petition, which was hung in the select committee room as a backdrop, mm. as you can see in, on the bottom right picture. And the government did act on public opinion. The Prime Minister herself acknowledged the impact um, of young people's voice on that matter. We've specifically used examples of young people making a difference by coming to Parliament and giving a submission to a committee just to demonstrate that anyone of any age and any ability can interact with this process. Here's probably a good point to stop to answer some of your more uh, questions. Um, a good question here, which is that, um, how do you get on a select committee? And where would you go to see which committees are available? So I guess from a, from a member of parliament's point of view, how do they get on a committee? And how do the public find out what they're doing and watch them? To, to, well, so you have to be a member of parliament to be on a select committee. And um, at the start of each parliament, um, when they're set up, as, they, as I said earlier, they have to be, um, members express an interest to their party and the ones they're interested in being on. And then one of the committees actually called the business committee, which deals with all of parliament's business, decides who's going to bring in each one. And overall, the membership of the committees um, reflects the membership of the House, so it's proportional to how many seats each party's got uh, in the House. So generally people go on something they're interested in. Um, in terms of finding out, there's information on the uh, Parliament website about what the committees are and what business they're doing. Every week uh, we publish there and through social media information about what each committee is actually doing each week. Um, and we also advertise publicly when they're calling for public submissions on something through those same channels. Great. We've also got a question that follows on from that. Apart from members of parliament, who else sits on select committees or I guess is involved in select committees? Mm. So no one, I mean, no one else sits on them, but um, any MP can come and watch a committee if they want to. Um, and some of them do drop in. Sometimes members swap around as well. If, if one of them's busy or sick, someone else might step in for them, another MP. Um, also in a committee room, there'll be um, some staff from my office, the office of the clerk, um, who act as advisors and administrators for the committee. Um, sometimes there'll be government officials as well, um, there to ad, uh, advise them and draft laws for them. Um, you'll often, in a public hearing, the press will be there as well. And, and of course, members of the public um, making submissions to the committee in their open session. Another question here, which is, uh, what's on public record in a select committee? What records are taken for the public to access what the committee discussed? Is it a verbatim record of what was said? Okay, well, that's a really good question. Um, there, there's always a verbatim record of Parliament itself called Hansard, which you'll probably know. Um, so everything that's said there is, is written down. Um, there's not always for select committees. It's up to them whether they want to have a Hansard of their meetings or not. So. My staff don't routinely make a, a record of everything that was said. But what a select committee does do is when it hears submissions and when it gets advice and then reports back to the House on its findings, it publishes all of that to the website. So every piece of advice, every submission that was received by the committee is publicly available. So you can see what they thought about. The committee also writes a report which explains its findings um, and the reasons for them. So you can see that as well to find out why they made the decision. And Andrea asks, how many committees can one member of parliament be on? Well, most of them are on one, um, but MPs who are in the um, government parties are sometimes on more because ministers can't be on committees um, and because the government has the most seats on committees, some of its MPs who are not ministers have to be on two and occasionally three committees, which is pretty busy. We have lots more questions coming in. We're gonna proceed with the next section and I promise you we will get to those questions um, later on. So let's look at the technicalities of making a submission now. To make a submission, I, I would go to the Parliament website, www.parliament.nz on your PC, your laptop, or even your mobile phone. 
Eva's going to send you a link now uh, to that website. I would find the Get Involved tab, which is up here on the top right hand side, and click that down uh, to make a submission. Alternatively, you can go straight to this page by going to www.parliament slash make a submission. It'll take you straight here. Eva's sending another link to that page just now. You want to find in this long list of everything committees are dealing with the item of business that you want to submit on and to click that. You can find out what's open for submission, like David said, on our social media. We also uh, plays on Parliament TV, which is uh, channels uh, Freeview 31, Sky and Vodafone 86. Items of business can be anything from a bill, a proposed law, a petition or an inquiry. A petition or an inquiry might lead to later legislation, depending on what Parliament decides. Let's say um, I want to submit on the Screen Industry Workers Bill. This was just one of the items of business on the list um, when I took these screenshots. So on the first page, um, it, that lists the item of business, there's some really useful information. One thing to note is um, the closing date of the submission, so how long you have to submit by. Um, down the bottom, there's some really useful related links that has um, material related to the item of business. And also the contact details of the select committee staff if you need to ask any questions. So once you've found your item of business, you can click, I am ready to make my submission, which is in green here. And uh, tell us how you want to submit. It might be as an individual or on behalf of an organization. If you are submitting on behalf of an organization, Give us a brief description of who the organization is and what its aims are. And make sure you have the authority and agreement of that organization for you to submit on their behalf. It's great to have one point of contact between an organization and a committee. And remember to put your name and what your role in that group is too. Here you also tell us if you want to make an oral submission to the committee, if you want to speak to them in person. You don't have to make an oral submission. Um, you could just make a written submission. But speaking to the committee, whether in person or through video conference, is called a hearing of evidence. And sometimes committees will travel outside of Wellington um, to hold hearings, but otherwise you can just video conference in with the same platform that we're using today, Zoom. Um, and people who make uh, an oral submission are called witnesses. So here's one of our select committee rooms. If you were a witness, this diagram shows you where you'd sit. At the front, we have the chairperson of the committee. On either side, we have government and opposition MPs. And then facing the chair, you'll have members of the public who are giving a submission or are giving a hearing of evidence to the committee. There might also be members of the public in the room. Uh, some of these, in fact, a lot of these meetings are open, so you can come and watch. And there might, so, might also be media in the room if it's an item of business with a lot of public interest. Next step in the process is um, putting in some contact details so that the committee can get in touch with any questions or to organize um, an oral submission. Here, you can also tell us anything that you'd like the committee to know. Um, you might want a translator or an interpreter for your oral submission, or you might have some accessibility requirements. So feel free to put some comments in there. Now comes you making your submission. It's great if you can use the online form, but you can feel free to upload your submission as a document if that's easier for you. You can write your submission in English or in Te Reo Māori. You can also send us a video of your submission in New Zealand Sign Language or upload it to YouTube and include the link in the online form. You don't actually have to write your submission. You can submit a drawing or a picture if that's how you want to express yourself in your submission. And we know that sometimes you might really care about an issue or um, an item of business, but you might not know what to write. Um, and reading legislation can be difficult if you don't have much experience with it. Um, so here are some resources that can help um, kind of 
with your submission and help understand the content. So the Parliamentary Information Service responds to requests from the public um, for information on any aspect of Parliament. So their email address is on screen. Um, if the item of business was a bill, there's lots of really useful information. There's the Bills Digest, um, which summarises bills. So you can find those on our website. Um, the explanatory note at the beginning of a bill gives a really nice um, short summary of what's inside. So you don't have to go trawling through um, the entire bill. Um, yet that gives a nice summary, um, which could inform your submission. We also have some documents, one called the Departmental Disclosure Statement and one called the Regulatory Impact Statement. So these are really useful um, for showing what the government intends with a piece of legislation, the problems that they're trying to fix and why they think this bill will fix it. Cabinet papers can also be a really useful um, way of understanding what government intended. Of course, there's your own research and don't forget your own opinion. The committee does want to hear um, about your experience and how this might affect you. So it doesn't have to be um, research and academic um, research. It can be your opinion. Here's some useful sentence structures that can help with writing a submission. So some quick tips. And remember that this will all be available later, so don't feel like you have to furiously scribble down notes. Um, you can make both comments and recommendations in a submission, or just one or both. It's up to you. If you're referring to a specific change in the bill you want to see, it can be helpful to try and identify which section or clause in the bill that you want to change. Oh. And here we've got some... Um comments about some tips for writing a submission. And we've also put this into a handy A4, which I'm putting the links in uh, the chat now. So give the general position. Tell the committee what you think about the item of business and why. It's really good um, to be clear about whether you support or don't support the item of business. Give recommendations. Tell the committee what you think it should do or change. And try and be concise. Um, headings, bullet points, um, paragraphs, that all really helps MPs reading um, your submissions. Be accurate. If you do use facts or figures, tell the committee where you found those facts and figures. Um, keep it relevant. Um, we talk about scope, so try and keep um, your submission relevant to the item of business. If you want to uh, talk about something outside of the item of business, feel free to send a letter to your local MP um, about an issue. But for your submission, keep it focused on what the item of business is about. And keep it simple. Try to avoid jargon, um, but if you do have to use technical terms, which sometimes you do, um, just explain what they mean. Great, and once you've inputted all those details and um, put in your submission, you'll have the opportunity to look over what you've written and make any edits that you wish. Um, please note that you don't receive a copy of your submission until it's published online with your name. So it's good to copy and paste it somewhere else if you'd like to go back and refer to it in the meantime. And once you click submit um, on that page, uh, you'll be taken to a page where it tells you you've completed the process. I think now's another good moment to uh, ask our resident experts some more questions. <laughs> Someone uh, asks, can anyone go and talk to a select committee? David, is, uh, is it restricted who can come and speak to a select committee? I think we might have lost our resident expert. Oh no. <laughs> well, while we try and get David back on online, I, I, can, I can have a go at answering that. No, there is no restriction on who can give a submission to a select committee. Um, as Eva said earlier, you don't have to be a citizen, a resident, any particular age. Anyone who has a view they want expressed to the committee can submit to them. Great. Let's get another question out. Um, will my voice be heard if I am to voice my opinion or views to a select committee? 
And they say, keeping in mind, children and teenagers tend to be undermined in so many different aspects when it comes to any form of political policies. It's a great question. Um, and I would say, yes, your voice will be heard. Um, as we've said, anyone um, of any age, of any ability can make a submission and their thoughts and their experiences are worthwhile. Um, I think it's, it's good to remember that members of parliament are people as well and a lot of them have children um, and everyone's been a child at some point in their life. So they will understand that um, items, you know, issues might affect different groups of people in different ways. So I wouldn't um, feel discouraged or discount yourself because you might be younger. I think often because the majority of people that submit to committees are adults, a youth voice can be really, really valuable in a committee hearing as well. Another really interesting question here, can an individual make a submission without signatures or support from other members of the public? And the answer is yes. There are kind of two things here. One is you as an individual making a submission to a committee, which you can just do as yourself, or you could send a petition to Parliament, which uh, once it's received by Parliament would go to a committee for discussion and consultation. So yes, you as an individual can make a submission. Should we take another question? Yeah, let's do that. One comment um, from one of our colleagues is that not every committee will call for oral submissions. This isn't a given, although it usually happens. So yeah, that's a great thing to keep in mind that um, it's usual practice for select committees to open for public submissions, but it won't always occur. Welcome back, David. Thank you. I, my internet's dropped out, so I'm on my phone now. No worries. Um, well, uh, let's just uh, move on to our last section of the webinar and then open it up totally for the rest of your questions. Um, keep sending those questions in though. Let's have a look at types of uh, some example submissions here. This is a submission on the Election Access Fund Bill from the Civics Education Trust of New Zealand. Eva's uh, put a link in the chat bar. They've used an online form which generates a submission to look like this. And as you can see, they've explained what their organization is. They've referred to specific clauses that they'd like to see changed in the bill. There is also another example here, um, and this was on the inquiry into captioning in New Zealand um, by Alexandra McKay, who was, I think, eight years old when she made this submission. Um, and as you can see, she has um, written a letter um, and drawn a picture as her submission. If you indicate that you want to speak to your submission and you're invited to come and speak to the committee, here's some tips. As we've said before, hearings are public and they are live streamed. So be aware of that when you plan your submission. You can bring supplementary written material, but be sure to bring copies enough for the rest of the committee to read. The committee's already read your submission, so you don't need to read, them, uh, read it to them again. It's a conversation. Introduce yourself, outline your key points, and save plenty of time to answer the committee's questions. And if you don't know an answer to the question straight away, you can offer to send that to the committee later. And after hearing all of the submissions, select committees will deliberate. So consider all that they've heard and read and um, understood. And they write reports. Um, as David said, which go back to the House to inform um, the lawmaking process. One thing to note is that while MPs will read your submissions, um, it doesn't mean that they'll agree with all the recommendations that you make. It's up to them as a committee to decide um, what they'll proceed with. They receive a large volume of submissions, so make sure your submission is clear and easy to read. And I've got I'll put a really interesting article from RNZ The House on Members of Parliament reading submissions in the chat now. Cool. So that's our part of the webinar. Um, hopefully everything made sense. Um, and I'm also going to put a page to our website 
that has some useful videos about the whole submission process. And I think now we're going to open up to questions. So we've finally reached our Q&A and I'm very happy to have you back for it, David. Um, I think you uh, might be muted, David. So I think you might need to uh, turn your microphone on. Well, while we're sorting that out, uh, a really interesting question here. What are the, that's perfect, thank you. Uh, question here is, what are the advantages of making an oral submission or giving a hearing of evidence to the committee? Well, I guess the, the advantage over, say, just making a written submission, um, probably the main one is the ability to answer questions. You know, if you make some good points in your submission and the members would like to follow up, um, they're much more likely to do that in person with you. And so it gives you a good chance I think to have an impact on the committee, but also to, to you know, answer any questions they might have, which you can't do obviously in, in a written submission. Another question we've got is, when writing a submission, how long do you suggest it be? For example, how much information is too much? Okay, that, that is quite a, a tricky one, I think. If you're making a general submission, either in support or against something, I, I think probably you don't want to go more than three or four pages. Um, you should be able to set out your opinion and supporting information in, in over that much space. But sometimes you might be making quite a technical submission. Um, and if you are and you're actually going to step through parts of the legislation, for example, um, it, it might need to be longer. And you might want to think about maybe attaching things as an appendix rather than just one long continuous piece of text. Um, so it really will depend what you're writing about. But I think generally probably three or four pages. I have another question here. When a select committee makes recommendations, yet they might not be legislative changes, mm. what happens if the government body, and the example I've used is the Ministry of Health, mm -hmm. or the DHB, doesn't follow through? Are they required to follow through on what a committee recommends? Oh, well, that's a really good question. Um, so when a committee makes recommendations that are not about legislation, but say in an inquiry or a petition, the government has to respond to them within 60 working days. Um, so they don't have to agree to do them, but they do have to either say they're going to do them or say why they're not going to do them. Um, if a committee makes a recommendation, say to the Ministry of Health or a DHB, and they, they don't follow up on it, um, then those bodies appear before the select committee once or sometimes twice a year as part of routine scrutiny of their performance. And so it's very likely the members of that committee will follow up with them about, you know, about why that organisation didn't do what it was asked. Now, committees don't always call for oral submissions, uh, do they? And someone's asked, can the committee turn down your request for an oral hearing? Mm. Um, I mean, they, they, they don't have to call for oral submissions at all, but um, they pretty much universally do. I think people expect that and, and you know, members, the committees are there so that they, they can hear from the public. Um, having said that, yeah, they, they don't have to accept particular submissions. Generally, they will only turn things back if the thing is you know defamatory or insulting or um, not related to what it is they're actually looking at. So it's a very small number that would, would go be sent back to the person. We've got a question here. What's the difference between a submission and a petition? Well, a petition is a request to Parliament as a whole asking it to do something. And it can be, really be just about anything, anything that's in Parliament's power that it can make a law about or can make a recommendation on. Um, and they go off to a select committee to look at. A submission is, um, I guess, a bit like a letter to a committee. So you're writing to it asking it to do something or giving some advice or your opinion on something. So you might make a submission on a petition, for example, if you're asked to. Uh, someone asks, when a committee receives a submission, how do they determine what submissions will be the most effective? So, um, yeah, mm. I guess what weight is put on submissions? Yeah. Um, they, I mean, they, they, committees try and hear from everyone that asks, but sometimes that's not just that's not possible. On the end of life choice bill, there were, I think, nearly forty thousand submissions, and a lot more wanted to be heard than could be. What the committee is really trying to do is make sure it hears a broad range of viewpoints, and that it considers all of those. Um, so they're not necessarily going to need to hear the same view if it's expressed by a lot of different people. So they would go through and I guess look, look um, partly for a broad range of opinions and from different groups and people, um, and then probably also look for any subject matter experts who have made submissions as well and 
those are likely to be the ones they want to hear from. We've got a question here about um, private sessions. So if, public, mm -hmm. if the public is not present in the committee sitting and it's a private session, are the recordings from that sitting available to the public for view? Okay, there are no recordings. There, there are no routine recordings of, of committee meetings. Um, the, the public parts are usually webcast and so anyone can watch those and they are available on demand. The private parts aren't generally recorded and so there is no, um, there is no record for anyone to have. Um, and that balance of, of hearing from the public in public but actually negotiating um, behind closed doors seems to work quite well for committees. Someone asks, who can view the submissions submitted to select committees? Are they a matter of public record? Yes, so anyone can view them. They, they belong to the committee while it's considering them. And usually when it hears from people, it releases their submissions. Um, and sometime in it, during its process, it will publish them all. Um, if it hasn't, then when it reports back to the House, all those submissions become public and, and anyone can see them. How many copies should one prepare for when doing an oral submission? Um, for example, if you want to bring additional information. I think we might have lost our expert again. Not now. Oh, oh, I can hear you again. Oh, that's right. sorry. I'm <laughs> question. Would you like me to repeat the question? Sorry. Yes, please. Yeah. Very good. Um, how many copies should one prepare for when doing an oral submission? For example, if they want to bring additional information. Okay, um, if, you, if you're going to bring additional information, it's really useful if you can give it to the committee staff first, um, ideally you know, a day or two before the meeting, because they can then get it around to all the MPs before the meeting. If it's something you want to bring along to the meeting, um, have a look at the website and find out how many members are on the committee. Generally, it's between six and 12, depending on the committee. So bring one for each of them, um, one for the staff and one for the officials. So I say the total number of MPs on the committee plus two would be fine. Good question here. Is there a time limit for uh, hearings of evidence uh, orally before a committee? Um, there, well, the committees set their own time limits for them and because um, in some cases, they get a lot of requests. Sometimes, unfortunately, those hearings have to be quite short. They might just be five or 10 minutes with some time for questions. Um, other times, they may be longer, depending on the subject and how much, um, you know, how many submissions they've got to get through. We've got a question here. Do members of select committees receive additional remuneration as such? No. Be being on a select committee is considered a, a normal part of their job. It's a requirement of pretty much every MP who's not a minister. So they don't get anything extra for doing that. The chair of the committee does, gets an extra allowance for chairing it because it's quite a lot of extra work. And the deputy chair gets a small uh, extra payment as well. A question about lobby groups. Can mm. lobby groups meet with our MPs outside of a committee hearing to sway their opinion? Yeah, well, I, I guess the first thing I'd say is within the committee and outside it, people are trying to sway MPs' opinions. That's the purpose of making a submission, and there's, there's no problem with doing that. Um, really, it's in the hands of MPs. They, they can meet with anyone they want to. Um, I think they're pretty careful about who they meet with. Um, and meeting with an individual MP, um, you know, isn't necessarily going to guarantee you can persuade a select committee. So, yes, people might do that, and they're certainly... You know, nothing illegal about that or wrong with it, um, but I'm not sure it's the most convincing way to proceed when you've got to actually convince 10 or 12 people in the end. We've got a question related um, to probably the current situation we're in. How do you think everything going on at the moment is going to affect policy development slash select committee process? Mm -hmm. Are consultations going to slow down for the next couple of months? Yeah, I, I think that's it's likely they will. So a lot of committees are continuing to meet online using Zoom. Um, and the Epidemic Response Committee is the obvious one that's televised at the moment as well. But there are uh, quite a lot of the others are meeting as well. Some of them have needed to go back and get a bit of extra time for their business. And I, I think it will depend how long the, uh, you know, the, the virus is around and, and how long we have to stay in lockdown. Um, it's seems less and less likely the government will be able to continue with its normal policy program. 
and there's going to need to be a lot of emergency response um, packages and policy. So I would think that will probably dem dominate the work for um, much of this year, if not longer. Someone asks, do select committees have subpoena powers? Oh, good question. Um, only two of them do, actually. Um, the Privileges Committee, which um, and, and basically is, a, is an internal committee that commit, investigates offences against Parliament, and the other one is the Epidemic Response Committee. So it has the power to compel people to attend or to um, provide papers to it. Um, the other committees don't have that power. If they um, want something and a person's not willing to provide it, they can ask the Speaker to issue a summons to have either the person appear or the, the papers delivered, and the, then that is compulsory. Good question here. How are smaller parties, such as the ACT Party, represented mm. in select committees, considering the small number of MPs? Yeah, well, and, and I think I said earlier on that um, seats on committees are proportional to seats in the House. There's roughly 120 seats on committees, I think a couple more, maybe 124. And so, so ACT could expect to have one seat on a committee. And uh, David Seymour does, he's on the Finance and Expenditure Committee. But you might notice he's also on the Epidemic Response Committee at the moment. Uh, and he's also on the Business Committee. And he's also um, able to attend the Standing Orders Committee. So it's pretty busy when there's just one of you. And when he had his end of life choice bill going through as well, he was um, attended Justice Committee meetings. So yeah, it's pretty taxing if there's just one of you. But really, I suppose he normally would have just the one seat. Um, a question which might need some fleshing out is a question about parliamentary privilege. Mm -hmm. In a select committee, if someone admits to uh, having uh, committed a crime during a hearing, does parliamentary privilege apply? So would you mind saying a couple of words about what parliamentary privilege is and if it applies yeah. in committees? Yeah, so I mean, it's not privilege in the sense of an advantage or wealth or anything like that. Um, it, it's a set of rules and practices that Parliament has about how it operates. Um, that um, really mean Parliament decides for itself um, how it's going to operate and the decisions it makes are not subject to, um, say, review in a court. And so um, a, a key example of that is freedom of speech, so that members of Parliament and actually people appearing before select committees um, are free to say anything they like and there can't be any legal consequence for that. So um, you could say something, say, that defamed someone, that damaged their reputation, and there would be no court action that could be taken. So. People need to be quite careful with that ability, but it, it does mean, um, and, and I think people are generally pretty responsible with it, it does mean if you're admitted to a crime in a select committee, um, and I've seen this happen, um, that the police couldn't use your admission in the committee as evidence that you committed that crime. Um, having said that, of course, you have still said that you've done it, and it might cause them to investigate it, um, and they're free to do that. What they couldn't do is use as evidence in court the fact that you admitted to it in a select committee. So it's pretty powerful, but it is there to protect witnesses so that if they appear and say something that someone doesn't like, um, you know, they can't get into trouble for that and they can't face legal consequences. The question here, is there a limit to submissions entered by a group or organisation? Are there benefits for that group if they do put their opinion and advice in more? If they put it in more, did you say? Um, well, there's not really. I mean, I think the committee would normally expect to get a single submission from an organisation. And if it's got supplementary submissions, you know, extra information it wants to send in to provide that as well. Getting submissions from multiple people across the same organisation, I don't know that that's going to have any greater impact. Where committees usually see that is they might sometimes get thousands of form submissions, which have standard text and people just sign their names to them. That has fairly little impact, I think. Um, because committees aren't really after numbers. They're not trying to do an opinion poll. What they want to know is what people's reasons are for thinking the way they do and, and, you know, and what their views are. And they don't need to hear that thousands of times. Um, we have a comment that uh, Jennifer found that dis uh, description of parliamentary privilege really helpful. Oh, good. Uh, someone asks, um, can anyone just submit a petition on the parliament website? Does it need the committee to approve the petition? Mm. And then what's the criteria for publishing that petition on the Parliament website? Oh, that is that is a really good question. Um, because in the last, I think since March of last year, we've had online e-petitions. Prior to that, they could only be on paper. Now they're both. Um, so if yeah, anyone can do one, again, same as making a submission, any age, uh, 
don't have to be a citizen of New Zealand or anything else. Um, so you can um, do a petition. Um, my staff will have a look at it. And first, first things I'll be looking for are that it complies with the rules, which are that it's got to be something Parliament can actually do. Um, so it, it, Parliament can't interfere with a court decision, for example. It can't uh, make a foreign government do something. So if you petition about those things, it'll probably get rejected. Um, but you, anything within its power, which is pretty large, you can ask it to do. Those, as I say, are moderated by my staff. You need to find an MP who'll present it, um, which, and most MPs will usually be willing to do that. They don't have to support this petition or agree with it, but they'll generally do it for you. Um, and uh, yeah, then, then it goes to the House. I read them out in Parliament, uh, and then I choose a select committee to send them to, and um, the committee will look at it then. But no, it doesn't have any role in, in um, approving them before they're submitted. Can the public have any say on which new laws and other changes come to Parliament, or can they only submit on changes that are already under discussion by the select committee? Mm. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, most legislation comes to Parliament from the government. A small amount comes from individual members, but generally it comes from the government. And so really the best way to, to influence that is to contact government ministers and advocate for a change that you think is important. Um, that's really the, the primary mechanism. The other one would be to go to your local MP or another MP that you know, or who might share your views and try and convince them to, to um, do a member's bill. So a, a, not a government bill, but a bill from an individual member um, that makes the changes you're seeking. Someone asks, can ministers not sit on any select committee or just committees related to their office? Right. So cabinet ministers don't sit on any committees. There's actually no rule that says they can't. It's a long-standing convention in Parliament. So just the way things are done. Um, and, and they don't sit on them. They're probably too busy in any case. Um, sometimes you'll see an associate minister, so someone who's not in cabinet might be on a committee. Generally, it won't be a committee related to their portfolio. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, cabinet ministers never do. It's quite an interesting one here. Um, I, no, I'm sorry, it's your turn here, we're gone. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> um, I thought that this might be a great one to finish on actually. Um, so why aren't there members of the public on select committees? Um, one person feels it would be beneficial to have one member of the public on certain committees. Sure. Well, that, I mean, that's a you know, pretty interesting um, and I suppose philosophical discussion to have. Um, I guess I, I think about select committees as, um, well, the subcommittees of parliament, really. Um, as you said at the start, Eva, you know, it makes sense for a group of 120 people to split off into small groups to look at specialist areas where the 120 of them couldn't spend the time. So, I mean, like most organisations, um, most companies, um, most state sector organisations, you know, the, the membership are, are the people who belong to that organisation. Parliament's no, no different. Um, there's nothing stopping them hearing from people. There's nothing stopping them. Committees always get, you know, advice and they can get independent external advice if they can, if they want to. I think the idea of having someone who's not elected on a body composed of elected representatives, I don't know if that seems very democratic to me. Great. Well, thank you so much, David, um, for well, answering all, right. all those questions. It felt it's very pleasure. quick fire. Um, <laughs> if people do have more questions, feel free to just put them in the chat and um, we'll be able to answer them later on because we'll have a record of them. Um, yep. Yeah, but we'd love um, for everyone who's come today to share their newfound knowledge um, with their friends and family. Um, Public tours are obviously still not reopened at Parliament, so we'd encourage you to download our virtual tour of Parliament, um, which takes you around the building. Uh, yeah, keep safe, um, and our house is your house, so please get in touch if you have any questions. Great, thanks everyone. Thank you all very much for your time today.